So I'm a nutritional therapist, so I sort of work with food, supplements, um, that's where I'm, I'm working. I'm, I'm working with testing, lifestyle changes. So I'm also looking to sort of line up doctors and people that I can also send patients to as well because I'm more doing the supportive role with food, with Biobran, with various things which I like to go into, go into in more detail. So um, I'm just talking about three patients. Uh, they are uh, they're all happy ending, so I'm not going to make anybody cry today. So <laughs> it's all going to be positive outcomes. Um, and they all, I mean, these are quite old case studies, just so you can see that they've all survived beyond five years, seven years. So it's a sort of encouraging tale, as it were. And um, so I'd like to just start. So I've been working with Biobram for 17 years, and uh, I still get excited about it because there's so much new research coming out all the time and hopefully we're going to have um, a research paper on Lyme disease quite soon, hopefully next year. So um, what interested me about Biobram was that it was developed originally to support cancer patients and um, when I started working as a nutritional therapist we had so many uh, people with cancer contacting us so I was looking for some heavyweight product that would really help support their immune system. So uh, the way I work is uh, I'm looking at biochemistry. Uh, so I use Biolab a lot, which is a, a lab in, in London. Um, I'm looking at um, detoxification. So I'm looking at toxins. I'm looking at DNA adducts. There's a fantastic lab called Acumen Labs that uh, looks at DNA adducts to see what's going on there. I'm looking at things like hormones. So I use Genova Labs for looking at what's going on there. Um, pretty much is how nutritional therapists, I think, work in, in work with nutrition. So um, over the years, I've worked with many different uh, cancers. Uh, I do work with some children that are at Great Ormond Street. It's just their mothers contact me and um, so I have worked with children and the nice thing is so far I've always got all my protocols passed by the pharmacist there so they're, they're actually very embracing well they're, they're tolerant of Biobran I don't want to exaggerate they haven't said I can't use Biobran you know they said yes to vitamin D they're a bit more edgy about probiotics but still you know there is lots of leeway there which is encouraging for someone working in this area. Um, so I've worked with breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, brain tumours, kidney cancer, a whole range of different cancers over the years, just in a supportive role basically. And um, basically looking at, you know, working on their immune system, their fatigue, their mood, their energy levels, and also their toleration of drugs, quality of life, all of those areas I'm interested in. Um, I think in a way probably most of you know what Biobrand's about now, that it's an immunomodulator that's had many peer-reviewed articles written on it um, and it's used in 49 countries across the world. It's non-toxic, it's passed an LD50 test, doesn't um, increase liver enzymes. Uh, it's from Humble Origins, from Rice Bran and they use the enzyme carbohydrates to break down the rice bran so it can actually be absorbed in the small intestines. Um, uh, so, and then when it's absorbed in the small intestine, it can really then go on to go into the bloodstream and activate immune cells and B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes and natural killer cells and interestingly dendritic cells as well which is um, research, I think, that was originally published in Neoplasma in 2009, uh, research carried out by Shola Juva, uh, Dr. Shola Juva, and um, I think it's since been duplicated and, and developed by Professor Gonan. Really very interested in boosting people's natural killer cells, partly because it seems to be so impactful on the ultimate outcome of their recovery. I just love that picture of a dendritic cell, <laughs> amazing cells, and this one has sprouted these wonderful dendrites. Um, these studies I've been, I was particularly inspired by, there's the one by um, 
Uh, this is uh, one which is uh, based on liver cancer, a three-year study, and it was a human study, so 68 patients over a three-year period. And what was really interesting about that was how it reduced their malaise, actually reduced um, the size of their tumours, improved energy, improved appetite, improved weight. So it was really encouraging, and it wasn't you know, just an in vitro study. It was actually you know, human beings. Uh, this study was also interesting. Um, this involved, this is um, Takahara, it's quite an old study now, but it involved 205 advanced cancer patients over an 18-month period, really looking at improving their quality of life and natural killer cells. And that paper is well worth looking at. Um, I I think actually this study has actually been referred to already, but it's a nice thing to sort of like um, strengthen your our case for wanting to boost natural killer cells because it's an 11-year follow-up study of Japanese men and women, uh, and it's a large study, 3,625 uh, men and, and women, and what they found was that basically the people um, with the lowest NK cell activity went on to develop cancer at much um, greater levels. So basically, uh, when they first started the study, there was no cancer incidence at all. Nobody had cancer. But then um, uh, when they reviewed them in 11 years' time, they found with women, those women who were in the lowest, um, who had the lowest NK cells had double the amount of cancer incidences and men had a third more cancer uh, uh, diagnosis. So that's quite an interesting study. I'd like to now talk to you about some of my patients. This is a, a bowel cancer patient. Uh, he was diagnosed with um, cancer of the uh, cecum. Uh, he was, so basically it was classed as a Duke C1 because it had spread to one lymph node, which was close to the bowel. When I first um, met him, he was 55. Very sort of optimistic sort of character, very chatty, very casual. <laughs> so, which probably actually helped with ultimately what happened to him. Um, it unfortunately had penetrated the bowel wall and it had gone into the fat that wraps itself around the, the bowel. Uh, and then um, it um, basically, they found that there was uh, some metastasis to the liver and um, some cysts as well, and five lymph nodes were affected. So um, he was given um, a, a combination drug for fairy, and um, basically he had his bowel resectioned. Um, bones and lungs remained clear. And what was interesting, his liver function was actually quite good, I think mainly throughout the whole thing. Uh, I'll tell you about his protocol in a minute. I'll just give you the overview so you have the whole picture, you have the, you know, what, what was going on in terms of his allopathic treatment as well as the natural medicine that I was offering him. So you just get the whole picture. Uh, so he finished uh, chemotherapy in December and he had few side effects. Uh, he was not sick, he didn't lose his appetite, he didn't even suffer hair loss, which was uh, probably quite pleasing for him. <laughs> he did have an operation on his liver to remove the lesion at the beginning of January, and then after that he had four to six weeks break from chemotherapy, and six lots of chemotherapy, again over a, a period of three months. Um, it was nice because he wasn't really anemic, he had three bowel movements a day, uh, Tiredness wasn't significant. Uh, he was very energetic, had good sleep, minimal stress. In fact, he was an ideal patient, actually, sort of like. Uh, and what he said was that he forgot about his cancer. It did not affect his life, which actually was quite amazing. Um, he had actually just a few weeks off of work, and he was a managing director, very pressurised, tough uh, work. Um, and um, by May 2013, he was told he was in remission. And four years on, his scans are still coming back clear. And uh, he emailed me as soon as I said, can I use your, your case study? He was on the P. He was back, got back to me straight away. But he says he feels fitter and healthier. And everyone comments how young he looks, which he's very pleased about because he's just turned 60. So um, he, he was a, a real success story. 
Uh, I'm just going to talk to you about some more complicated, more involved patients now. Um, and I'll just also go over what we actually did with, um, with uh, F, I'm <laughs> calling him F. Um, he basically, with this particular patient, he had, um, this is the one with bowel cancer, he had a high fibre breakfast, and that was really just to reduce the transit time of the food so that um, the colon wasn't exposed to lots of carcinogens. Um, he, um, we had lots of, um, we used bowel flora, um, we wanted to boost bowel flora, we wanted to bolster the synthesis of short chain fatty acids, um, and we wanted to reduce beta glucuronidase because we didn't want beta glucuronidase to be basically um, undoing all the good work that his liver had done and, and allowing uh, toxins to be re-released into the body again. So that was the goal, is to really sort of work on all those things. So the breakfast had lots of fibre in it, had psyllium husks, rice bran, apple pectin, flaxseed, a whole range of things. Um, Dietary suggestions, we used coconut oil. We didn't want fats to oxidize and damage, so we used co co coconut oil for cooking. Uh, he became dairy-free. His wife was amazing. She got right behind it and enthusiastic. Uh, basically, we combined protein with complex carbohydrates to keep blood sugar levels really regulated. We didn't want any sudden spikes in blood sugar levels. We didn't want um, high spikes of insulin with um, uh, insulin-like growth factor being released because obviously then that's not a great idea. Um, meals would comprise of organic chicken, brown rice, sweet potato, lots of raw colourful salads, porridge with raw nuts and seeds and blueberries, organic eggs, um, rye bread, um, lots of peas and pulses, quinoa, buckwheat and noodles, lots of oily fish as well, um, and low glycemic fruit, so things like apples, pears, pomegranates, um, berries, uh, definitely not bananas because they're just too sugary. I know Gerson therapy very much frowns on bananas, so sort of like took uh, my lead from lots of different sort of proven um, food diets from, that have gone before. Um, avocados we used a lot of because rich in glutathione um, is two-thirds protein. Um, lentils and of course turmeric. <laughs> I know lots of people talked about turmeric already but I mean turmeric's wonderful if it's cooked in um, ideally coconut oil with black pepper because then it's much more easily absorbed and then cold pressed olive oil. There's some lovely studies on miso as well, how it actually helps to induce apoptosis, uh, particularly in colon cancer. So there's lots of things that they can do which really empowers them because they're, they're being proactive about their own health. I think that's the nice thing about diet. It's, you're, you're not just saying, oh, there's nothing you can do. Let's see what we can do for you. It, it kind of puts the power, gives the power back to them. Um, so there was also an emphasis on food naturally high in B17, as B17 is, is toxic to cancer cells. So lots of blackberries. Blackberries are particularly interesting because they're meant to hold lots of different growth factors in cancer. Um, and they're free in the autumn, so <laughs> even no cost involved. Um, mulberries, raspberries, watercress. So all of these um, wonderful things are very rich in B17. And uh, there's a wonderful uh, book called uh, The Little Cyanide Cookbook, uh, which is actually written by a toxicologist and it's full of, packed full of recipes which um, use these foods that are high in B17. And also you can scare your dinner guests by having this book on show as they're coming through the door. So um, he was um, encouraged to filter water. We didn't want, particularly wanted to avoid hormones, particularly wanted to avoid estrogen, um, methane, fluoride, all those things that are not ideal, uh, heavy metals and bacterias, herbicides. So we talked a lot about that and the best way to filter water. Um, and he did some 
juicing, but not around the time when he was having chemotherapy, because again, you don't want the body to detox too quickly. Uh, they've got lots of chemotherapy in their tissues. You, you just need a gap before you start juicing properly. I, I think um, Gerson therapy usually recommends about four pounds of juice during chemotherapy, but no more than that. It's just too overwhelming to the organs of detoxification. Uh, and Epsom salt baths as well uh, are, are fantastic and really relaxing as well and a great way of conveying mag magnesium into the body. Um, the supplements included um, probiotics. We used um, cell food concentrate, which is a liquid oxygen. And the nice thing is that also helps to boost things like ferritin and hemoglobin uh, in a way that's not, um, that shouldn't feed cancer cells. Um, this, I really love this product, Live 52. Oh, I'll use my light. Um, Live 52 is a, a wonderful Ayurvedic product. Again, you sort of don't want to go in too heavily when people are having lots of chemotherapy because it's quite detoxifying. It can um, boost phase one and phase two liver enzymes, but it also boosts um, blood filtration. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a really useful aid. Use, we use methylcobalamin, um, so B12, just to really boost red blood cells. And it's quite helpful any, for any neuropathy that they might have due to chemotherapy. Um, use fat-soluble vitamin C. And of course, we use Viabran. He was on three grams, and he, he felt really well on it. Um, so that was a that was kind of like my backbone. If I can get the biobrand into them, because it's it it's it's working on so many different levels. Um, you know, it's working on the dendritic cells, the NK cells. It's reducing inflammation. It's helping with fatigue. So I feel that if I can get that in, then I all the other things I can then pin around it and, and work on different um, problems that might be occurring. Um, so EPA, we use D3. In this case, we use apricot kernels, um, magnesium glycinate, and selenium yeast. So I was only really using natural selenium. Um, I never use um, synthetic selenium, because I have heard uh, that there's some quite big um, studies done where selenium, when it was used in a non-synthetic form, actually caused uh, problems, certainly with prostate cancer patients, so I sort of religiously stick just to the natural selenium. So I'd like to talk to you now about um, this patient, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma patient, uh, a lovely girl, really good patient actually, very calm, very stoical, a much better patient than I'd ever be. So used to come in a very matter-of-fact way with all her shopping list to show me what she was eating. Um, so N, N was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in January 2008. Uh, she had noticed lumps on her neck, but unfortunately by the, that stage, it was already uh, stage 4B. So it was very advanced cancer and sadly didn't seem to have many symptoms until uh, it was at a very advanced stage. And um, she was just a, you know, in her 30s. She had so many drugs, and obviously people in this room know more about these drugs than I do as I'm not uh, an oncologist, but I just wanted to give you the overall picture to see what she was up against. And I guess from a nutritionist point of view, you, you can see that it's a lot for the body to cope with as well, so um, you really want to help to strengthen her. She had, uh, yeah, so she had six cycles of ABVD, um, but unfortunately there was still disease progression and then she had three cycles of uh, DHAP, um, uh, which included a, a steroid as well. Uh, and then at that point, uh, she was actually um, given a stem cell transplant. So this beam chemotherapy, I understand that was just to close down her immune system so it could receive the stem cell transplant. Uh, and this was her own cells that were being transplanted back to her. It wasn't from a host. Um, so uh, she described the whole experience of having the uh, beam chemotherapy as awful. She immediately felt sick, shivery and achy. And that was basically, in her own words, it was to wipe out her immune system. Um, 
So I first met um, N in July 2010, so she was already so far down the road with her treatment. Uh, she was 38 and around that time she was having another kind of uh, chemo com combination uh, with prednisolone as well. But she was um, anemic, uh, she was suffering from neuropathy, she had really bad low platelets and it, it took me some time to work out the best way of dealing with low platelets, which I was using Ayurvedic products, partly because I, I worked at an Indian company, so I, I learned a lot about Ayurveda, um, but that doesn't seem to make any impact on the low platelets. She was neutropenic, she had really low potassium levels, uh, so that was managed by something called Sando K, which is an allopathic product, there wasn't anything I prescribed, and she was experiencing cramps in her legs, um, and she was she kept on coming down with infections, pleurisy, that kind of thing. She was um, chest infections, and she was having to have intravenous antibiotics. Um, she was still having her periods, but they were very irregular. Um, so she was suffering from lots of menopausal symptoms and night sweats, and she lost a stone in weight, which uh, was never gained back. So in two thousand and November two thousand and ten. Uh, so many of her uh, different types of blood cells actually sort of went just plummeted well below the uh, reference range and her, at that point her treatment was her allopathic treatment was considered palliative um, her liver enzyme the ggt was really elevated uh, 231 to 231 and also her alkaline phosphatase was uh, quite high um, and despite a platelet infu infusion on the 22nd of October, um, her platelets were quite quickly only 11. Uh, she also her interleukin two levels were non-detectable. She had um, a test, and you just you know there was no interleukin two. Uh, it was also the cancer was also encroaching on her jaw as well. So it was quite um, an advanced case. Um, and then later on, her platelet slipped, slipped further down to six. So she was given another platelet infusion. Um, so she, she had a test at NeuroLab, which is a, a lab in, in Britain, and it found that she had really elevated infections. Uh, the non-genoic uh, DNA and RNA levels were really raised. Um, and also um, surviving gene expression that was actually within the reference range, which was one good thing, because surviving is produced by cancer cells just to help them resist apoptosis. So that was one good thing, that that was actually in the reference range. Uh, so she was off chemotherapy from the 20th of December, uh, but by January, the lumps were already manifesting themselves again in her neck. Uh, and then there was a shadow on her lungs, uh, which turned out to be pleurisy. Um, on the good side, platelets began to climb again, and liver enzymes became, went back into the reference range. Uh, the weight increased, her appetite was good, and her cramps were gone, and, and uh, there was no tingling in her uh, feet and fingers. Uh, so N, um, N's doctors reduced her prednisolone. Um, so later on, uh, in 2011, she started a, another round of chemotherapy, which presented new challenges. So uh, hemoglobin went down, not too drastically. Platelets went down to nine, and again, GGT went up again. Um, she was just too tired to cook, so it was no good having these elaborate um, food plans. Um, she hadn't been able to sleep in hospital, so she was uh, struggling again. Um, and then the platelets went down to six. The last chemotherapy session was on the 28th and she was neutropenic for a week. Um, uh, so, so again, this constant struggle with platelets, all of those things. Um, but um, she had uh, another lung infection as well. But uh, interestingly, when her PET scan came back at that time, it came back negative, which was um, quite interesting and obviously really uh, amazingly um, positive news for her and uh, she was actually at this point uh, considered to be in remission by her clinicians and then at that point she started having um, chemotherapy in preparation for donor stem cell transplant because uh, her sister uh, actually agreed to be a donor. Uh, so there were various health issues um, post, um, you know, post transplant 
uh, menopausal symptoms, underactive thyroid, uh, tender fingertips, clicking joints, cramps. Many of the things that probably a lot of you have seen, and certainly a lot of us, probably more people that work in uh, natural medicine will be trying to get to grips with. We're sort of trying to deal with the collateral damage and just helping in that way, helping to strengthen the nerves, um, helping to reduce cramps, helping to um, boost bone density, uh, getting essential fats in for dry skin. So these are the areas we would be looking at. Uh, she also had a lot of gut fermentation, mild yeast overgrowth. Um, so she was poured on antibiotic, uh, which she is actually still on today, surprisingly enough, because obviously this, we're now 2017. Um, so she is now considered to be cancer free, and, and, which is quite amazing considering she was, had, um, she was just having palliative treatment uh, when I first met her. So I'd just like to talk a bit about what we did Again, she was having Biobrand three times a day. That was a really important part of her protocol. She was also having Corella green smoothies. She was having um, quercetin as well, which has antihistamine effects. Um, she was having Tima's. Oh, I'm sorry, I have a typo there. But anyway, zeolite. <laughs> Obviously, missed out the L. But um, so she was having uh, Tima's, which is a fantastic way of getting rid of so many different toxins, of heavy metals. I know, for instance, just things like Candida can hold 10 times its own weight in heavy metals. And when the immune system is suppressed, it's so easy for Candida to sort of rampage through the gut and um, just, just grow and cause problems. Um, also, uh, she was having, again, liposomal vitamin C because she was having so many viral infections, she was very susceptible in that way. Uh, she was having olive leaf complex. She was also having something called cell vestrals, which actually activates an enzyme called CYP1B1, which is meant to be the Trojan horse of, of cancer cells. It sort of, you know, is, is their weak spot. If you can activate that, it can help to kill cancer cells. I, I don't, I think it's just part of the story. It's not a standalone product, but it's just be part of your arsenal, as it were, of what you're throwing at the cancer. Um, selenium yeast she was having, again, um, vitamin B12. She was having a lot of neuropathy. Uh, and there was a, a, a fantastic acupuncturist who works with a lot of my cancer patients. and that was working really well with the neuropathy and really kind of helping to get rid of the tender fingertips and toes. Um, she also was having um, a lovely form of EPA that I really like called Veggie EPA, which helps to reduce inflammation. Um, I think there's some studies that shows that it can actually help uh, induce apoptosis. She was having high dose D3, so usually at least 6,000 IUs, maybe more, 8,000. Again, I put her on the Ayurvedic product, Live 52. Uh, she was having copper, that was probably just temporarily. Um, it's great to get the copper in sometimes to boost superoxides, dismutase, that when you test, tends to be quite low in many cancer patients. So, you know, really boosting sort of uh, endogenous antioxidants by using uh, copper just temporarily. Or copper-rich foods, like many of the nuts are very rich in copper. Um, this I really like, the Resbid, it's NAC, it's really good for neutropenia, works really well with selenium, it's a time release NAC. Um, and at the time we were using Primal Defense uh, Probiotic. I was using Glutamine at that point, um, I probably wouldn't use that now because this is an old study, uh, I, I'm very concerned about it converting to uh, glutamic acid and you know affecting brain chemistry adversely and you know making people more agitated and anxious it was particularly an issue with Lyme's patients which is my other uh, patient group so I figured that maybe it's not such a good idea for cancer patients either but at the time um, I was using that. Liver extract really boost haemoglobin and um, also trying to boost stomach acid just to help with digestion, which obviously is very challenging when you're having lots of chemotherapy. She had huge amounts, you know, she was a, a royal trooper where she 
just went through it in such a sort of calm manner. Um, magnesium, particularly important for her because she had all these like terrible cramps in her calves. And um, I was using Asphalia for, for many reasons. This is, Asphalia is a sort of a product made in um, the UK. It's a form of melatonin, which is actually allowed in this country because we in England we're not allowed to use melatonin. But you can use it from the plant form, and this is derived from um, green barley grass and wheat grass. And it did seem to work quite well with really bolstering platelets, but also um, helping with sleep, but also boosting uh, interleukin 2 as well. So it's a sort of really nice sort of all, you know, it's a nice thing to include. And particularly for her, because she had such a battle with platelets. Um, and she was uh, also doing Shigong. She was quite, that was quite important to her. She emphasized she was doing Shigong throughout her whole treatment. It was, again, another, oh, okay, fine, that's good. <laughs> right, uh, this is gonna be really fast then. This is um, a child with medulloblastoma who was at Great Ormond Street. Uh, he, when he was, had the brain tumour when he was six, uh, and that's when I first met him. Uh, he was just about to start treatment at Great Ormond Street. Uh, he'd already had uh, some surgery in Brazil that removed the tumour, and there didn't seem to be any sequela left. So that was very successful. But uh, unfortunately, uh, they were very concerned because of a very aggressive tumour that it might come back. So um, it, it, it was decided that he would go on the Packer protocol, which uh, actually was invented by somebody called Packer, <laughs> logically. And um, it, it involved having um, cisplatin uh, and vincristine and lomustine. Uh, there was a great, and also radiotherapy as well. There was a big deba debate with his parents and also uh, the uh, clinicians at the hospital because if, you, if they were worried about um, brain dam or damage to his brain, that he would never be able to live independently, that he would never go on to further education, and you know his long-term health if they went in too heavy with the radiotherapy. So it was finally decided that he would uh, go in at quite a low uh, radiotherapy, um, 23 grey, uh, after lots of um, debate, in, uh, including uh, talking to Packer himself. Uh, it was partly because he was a very bright boy and they were worried that he'd become angry and stressed and frustrated if he underperformed at school uh, and that wouldn't be conducive to his recovery. Um, I'm just going to speed along something, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to say some of what we did um, and also how he didn't have hardly any time off school. What was interesting about this boy was that, um, I've got quite a lot of detail, uh, maybe I can send it to you, uh, it, because he, the, he had so few days at school, off, of, off from school during his treatment, that actually the days he wasn't at school, equated to the days all the other children in his treatment uh, group were at school. So that was quite amazing and, and it was um, noted by his oncologist at Great Ormond Street. But again, we, we did, we went in with uh, two lots of, two sachets of Biobram, of turmeric, we used a lot of miscellaneous foods, uh, you know, things like okra, um, plantain, um, uh, th those kinds of foods, very um, soothing to the gut lining. Uh, we used corella as well, we used ginger and flaxseed. We used, because he was a child, we used Brazil nuts as a source of selen selenium and vitamin D and acerola, uh, vitamin C, so vitamin C derived from cherries. And red lightning, which is a, a, a powder which is full of antioxidant rich food, red, red foods actually, um, and lots of green tea, Biostraph elixir. Biostraph was partly because we were very concerned about him losing weight due to radiotherapy uh, and sprouted flaxseed. Um, he was given an alkalizing diet 
and also foods that will actually boost the p53 gene like pomegranate and raspberries um, so um, and we also plan to use Mentat, which is an Ayurvedic product, just to really enhance his cognitive function after his treatment. Uh, I won't go on too long, because I know we're virtually out of time. Um, so, did a lot of work with food, because the, the hospital were very concerned about cachexia, which is very common in children, and it's almost routine that they get fitted with a feeding tube, but he was still allowed to do oral feeding as well as tube feeding, and they were very concerned to put him on a, a build-up drink, which in the end was um, decided it would be uh, Petisorb, which is a whey protein drink. Um, okay, okay, Karen, okay. <laughs> he started, uh, basically, he was also given a GCSF, uh, prophylactically, so they were just preparing him, and he started radiotherapy in September 2010, and he had the vincristine, which is part of the PACA protocol. Um, sadly, he, he developed some hearing loss, so uh, um, it was replaced by carboplatin, but the problem with the carboplatin is his white blood cells then began to plummet, so at that point we used more Biobran, so that was a great thing, it's very tolerable at higher levels. Um, I understand from previous uh, presentations here that some paediatric patients are using 5 grams, so it's a very safe thing to give to small children. And I myself have used um, Biobran on a 10 month old baby before with a brain tumour, and it was all okay by Great Ormond Street, so uh, it's um, so that well, was quite comforting. <laughs> um, he also yeah, began to take as asphalia because he also had terrible platelet loss. At one point, his platelets were down to one, so he was very regularly having um, platelet infusions. Um, we introduced lots of avocado smoothies and coconut milk just to keep the weight on. Um, so that was also an important part of what we were doing. His mother was quite amazing. Uh, I think Great Ormond Street were not happy with probiotics. Uh, they said, well, friendly bacteria can become unfriendly. So we used a product called Regulat, which is fermented superfoods. Was a lot of battle with uh, neutropenia. Um, we introduced things like Sarah Enzyme and fresh liver to help with his um, anemia as well. Uh, So he, con he continued to take three sashes of Biobram, particularly as his lymphocytes were very low. Um, and then he, things began to improve, his energy began to improve. Um, in terms of remission, this term doesn't really apply to him because when they did the surgery, there was no residual disease. But seven years on, his scans are till, still coming back cl uh, clear. So that's uh, really heartening. Um, in terms of, I'd, I'd maybe briefly just say very briefly about school, because it kind of gives you an idea of the shape he was in, the fact that he could attend school. Um, during the five weeks of radiotherapy, he attended most afternoons. His radiotherapy sessions were almost at, always at 10 a.m. By 11.30, they were either on their way to school. Uh, on the Mondays, he had been Christine. Um, so, he, he missed very little. He yeah, did not really miss any school between the end of radiotherapy and the start of chemotherapy. Uh, so certainly um, the, the oncologist actually wanted to know what he was doing. Uh, the, four, the first four cycles of uh, PACA were inpatient for three days. Obviously he had to be at the hospital then. Um, his mother actually gave quite detailed instructions of how it was for him. But um, so generally, he he would miss the Monday, but would generally uh, attend school the rest of the time. What what the oncologist put it down to in, in October 2011, the oncologist told uh, the parents that M was her only patient who had gone to school throughout the PACA protocol. That many children only managed to attend school for as many days as M had missed. 
and she, she put it down to a mixture of the child's determination and parental support and she really wants to know what supplements he was on. So I, I feel a lot of that has to be thanks to Biobran and um, some of the other things we were doing. So he's now 12 years old and he's doing well at school. He has some problems processing verbal information. He still unfortunately has a, uh, some hearing issues. He has a hearing aid and wears a grommet, but he's growing well. He does need a growth hormone, but but he is showing signs of puberty, which his endocrinologist is very happy about because of all the things that can be affected adversely by you know, what what's, uh, he's been through. Uh, so my conclusion is uh, that, that Biobram, I think, is a really important part of my protocol. I've been using it for 17 years. I approached it as a skeptic. I wasn't working for um, any company that um, you know, was a distributor of Biobram. Uh, originally it was just one of many products that were out there but I've, I've been a, a convert ever since and I feel I, I sort of tell my patients like you're compiling an army and I really feel Biobran is like your SAS men that like really hunt out the cancer cells they're the kind of elite soldiers as it were and I just feel it's there to support people through some of their darkest days and um, I will continue to use it.